This webinar is brought to you by the New Hampshire Training Institute on Addictive Disorders. You can access the recording of this webinar in the future at your convenience where it will be archived at www.nhadaca.org. After completing the webinar, please upload and complete the quiz. You'll also find it on our website. You can email, fax, or mail the completed quiz to the contact information below. If you're a member of NAHATICA or NADAC, the certificate for this webinar is free. If you're not a member, the, free, the fee is $15. You'll receive a certificate worth one CE once you've completed and passed the quiz and paid for the webinar, if applicable. Through a co-sponsored with New Hampshire Training Institute on Addic Addictive Disorders, this one-hour event is pre-approved by the New Hampshire Board of Licensing for Alcohol and Other Drug Use Professionals. If you have any trouble at all viewing the webinar, audio problems, or have any technical questions, please contact NHTIAD at 603-225-7060. You can find the number on the bottom of the screen throughout the entire presentation. Any questions, email. You can email your questions regarding the material you'll see today to Training Institute at nhadaca.org. The music in the background, I'm not sure you can hear it, I've turned it down. It's free, downloadable off YouTube. The title is Alpha Waves for Music to Study and Focus. The goal of our presentation today is to provide you with a practical hands-on experience using evidence-based mindfulness practice relevant to substance use and mental health disorders, recovery, and maintenance. The objectives today are to provide you resources and a definition of mindfulness, define trauma-sensitive practice, reinforce mindfulness as an evidence-based practice, review basic anatomy and physiology of the mechanics of breathing, and most importantly, experience at least three mindfulness practice sessions with a written protocol that you can take home or use in the office. And finally, provide an example of a treatment plan progress note inclus inclusive of, of a mindfulness practice. My name is Angela Thomas-Jones. I've got over two decades of experience working in behavioral health and hold a master license as an alcohol drug abuse counselor and I'm a candidate for licensed clinical mental health counselor, as well as registered as a Yoga Alliance teacher for children and adults. I've completed postgraduate certification with the Trauma Center of Justice Resource Institute, where I studied under the direction of Dr. Bezel Vanderpop. He was one of the contributing um, contributors to the defining the PTSD diagnosis in the DSM, which was about 20 years ago. And complete, I've completed their yoga teacher training with the authors of Overcoming Trauma Through Yoga, Reclaiming the Body. That was published in 2010. And I've also trained with Yoga Warriors, a specific yoga practice designed for veterans. My work with the, in yoga teaching with the Norris Cotton Cancer Center of Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center led to my development of gentle yoga. It's a style of practice utilizing trauma-sensitive protocols influenced by Kripalu and Hatha yoga practices. I've recently published a literature review called Trauma-Sensitive Yoga Practices, and you can find that entire document at my website, which is my name, AngelaThomasJones.com. In fact, most of this webinar is pretty much cut and pasted out of that document. Currently, I teach mindfulness as part of my work as coordinator of substance use and mental health services at Grafton County House of Corrections. I also teach ongoing gentle yoga classes to the general public as part of my private practice in Littleton. So you can expect today 
an introduction, a brief review of what mindfulness is and what the research says, and most importantly, actually do mindful practice at the end of our time together. So you can expect to experience my particular style of teaching mindfulness, and I like to use, you'll see here, there's quite a lot of visual reference, seasonal quotes, music, photographs. Sometimes I use storytelling and picture books to reinforce the intent or focus of the class. Today, I'll use a few quotes and a synergy chime to mark transition points. I'll let you hear it right now. Here it is. Sometimes I use that with the classes, um, depending on our focus. That's what a synergy chime looks like. They can come in a portable size or much larger. I'll be paraphrasing some of these slides. In fact, I may just skip over some of these at the beginning because um, I really want to focus on giving you a quality experience of mindfulness. Like I said early, there are there is a script included as part of your uh, handouts, and you can upload that when we get to that point if you would like to follow along. Otherwise, there's no need to take notes. Everything that I'm talking about is in the in this PowerPoint presentation in your handout. So I really would like for you just to relax, take in the information, and enjoy our time together. All the references and details are at the end. And again, you can visit my website to get more information regarding tra trauma-sensitive yoga practice. So now let's begin. It's an invitation. Let's start now. Find a comfortable seated position. Grow your spine long. Relax and open your throat. Soft jaw. A contemporary Tibetan teacher says, our feelings and our bodies are like water flowing into water. We learn to swim within the energies of the body senses. Breathe. Relax. Be here now. Mindfulness and evidence-based practice. Western psychology is in the midst of a dynamic process of evolution toward a much more holistic approach to illness, intervention, recovery, and the mer merging of this process with Eastern culture influence therapies is changing the way the field views the clinician, the client, evidence-based practice, and current future research. What is mindfulness? John Kabat-Zinn, who's the founder of the Mind Body Institute in Massachusetts, says, and I think he says it best, paying attention in a particular way in the present on purpose. Just reviewing other definitions. Most importantly, because this sometimes comes up, particularly for recovery-based populations, it is a non-religious practice, even though it has its roots in Buddhist meditation. Western culture mainstream through the 60s and 70s, had, and particularly through people like John Kabat-Zinn, have helped bring it into a more um, scientific approach. So for example, in 1979, Kabat-Zinn he name branded a practice called mindfulness based stress reduction. And you've probably heard of it. It's quite pop popular. And there's a link at the bottom there under the greater good. That's a great resource that you can actually hear and see Cabot's in talk about his practice. It is a discipline. Just like athletics, learning a new skill, it requires practice. And the purpose is to build an, a healthy connection between the mind and the body in order to, to help ourselves calm the mind. And the first step is learning how to breathe. The next step is training our mind to observe rather than judge. So thinking back to what the Tibetan poet says, Tolku, our feelings and our bodies are like water 
flowing into water. We learn to swim within the energies of the body senses. So what's the relevance as a recovery maintenance skill, particularly for addictions and co-occurring disorders? Nora Volko, who's the director of our National Institute on Drug Abuse, explains that the comorbidity, the co-occurrence, we need to first recognize that drug addiction is a mental illness. It's a complex brain disease characterized by compulsive, at times uncontrollable craving, seeking, and use despite devastating consequences. So the behaviors that stem from drug-induced changes are also brain-based chemical. She goes on, this is familiar. And again, the relevance. Mindfulness is a skill of self-awareness, which is part of the first step in recovery, recognizing my life is out of control. I need to make a change. Self-awareness is the cornerstone skill for unraveling the complexity of addiction and co-occurring disorders. So we're moving into some of the research. The link between stress and illness provide a gateway for understanding the need for developing prevention and intervention. The National Technical Assistance Center for State and Mental Health Planning says the link between stress and illness provide us a gateway with understanding. And the majority of clients served by public mental health and substance use have been exposed to multiple experiences of trauma, including domestic violence, abuse, neglect, natural disasters, crime, and war. Most of these survivors present with co-occurring disorders and should be provided with integrated mental health substance use services. The ACE study, it's been around for years, since the mid-1990s, and it studied 30,000 people out in Promonte, California. And out of the 19,000 that have uh, responded, there's a direct link between early childhood disease or early childhood trauma connecting to disease that manifests later in life. And that research shows, again, I'm just paraphrasing down, that they, these behaviors appear to be coping mechanisms for the people who have had adverse childhood experiences, the ACE study. And their conclusion is that adaptive behaviors may also reflect the effects of the adverse experiences on the developing brain chemistry and lead to the adoption of the same coping mechanisms. So this connects with homeostasis, our biology, the way we are made to work up. So the homeostasis, it, that's about keeping balance. We're designed to be balanced. We're designed to adapt and survive. So when the brain senses danger, our heart rate goes up. Primary purpose of the autonomic nervous system is to respond to that fight flight response. It's instinctual, it's a base function. The endocrine system begins pumping adrenaline, cortisol, giving us additional energy. The digestive tract shuts down. Our frontal lobe of the brain where we can make logical decisions, that shuts down. This response in times of legitimate crisis, heightened state of in induced could be unnecessary and it triggers a panic attack. So here's a diagram. We've been having a lot of images and, and studies and workshops on the relevance of neurobiology. And I like the terms called bottom-up therapies or somatic therapies or mind-body therapies. Those are the therapies that address the body, the mind-body experience. It activates what's called the reptilian brain and the limbic brain where our instinctive drive, fight-flight instincts, and then the limbic brain is where our emotions become connected to those drives. The very top gray area, the largest part that separates us from the rest of our animal relatives is where our rational thinking, writing poetry, doing physics, balancing the checkbook. And when we're stressed, when the limbic brain and the reptilian brain are activated, the, the rational part shuts down completely. 
And that's where the connection is with muscle memory. Bezel van der Kolk uses the term, the body keeps score. And the research that Perry Ogden there that's referenced, they state conscious and unconscious memory are the main components of learning. Memory encompasses and recalls somatic states. So a great example is some really positive somatic memories are, for example, for me, from childhood, I loved waking up on the you know, Sunday morning, smelling um, bacon, frying, and coffee, even though I didn't drink coffee, just the association of those smells stimulates a really positive memory, a body memory. Even smells do the same thing. Well, it can also have the opposite effect, be a negative trigger. Brain plasticity. Adaptation, that's what that means. It's part of our homeostasis about keeping in balance. There's this great, instead of reading all of that, there's this great uh, link um, that you can click on that it's about two minutes. I'll, I'll cue you when we get to that part. You can click on that to read, to listen to it. It's a great explanation instead of me talking, but the point of is emotions occur not only by conscious choice, but as part of the limbic system. And it interrupts our life, particularly if we have a trauma history. It interrupts our ability to engage in the present moment because of that muscle memory. So for example, teenagers or even adults, when they're triggered, they may present as defensive, non-compliant, uncooperative, argumentative, and it may be what that A study proved, that it's an adaptive behavior. It's a part of their survival that worked for them during the trauma, or maybe the person's still living in that way. So oftentimes, that behavior is written in the progress note, or the individual is labeled in the diagnostic uh, review statement, non-compliant. A trauma-sensitive practice would take another view and ask the question, what is the root of that? That's a trauma-sensitive practice for many. Experiencing body sensation or emotion is a trigger, and it sets off that chain reaction that could lead to relapse. So that's an important thing to think about if you choose to introduce a mindfulness practice in your treatment program, is for those folks, and we know from the research, that the majority of people who come in for treatment through public services have often an unreported trauma history. So regardless if they've reported or not, we can just assume that it's there. Again, Basil van der Kock says, working with trauma is as much about remembering how one survived as it is about what is broken. It's a strength-based perspective, taking a strength-based view of this non this non-compliant combative argumentative resistant behavior might be what helped this person survive so there's the link you can go over under the chat and click on that uh, link we've learned uh, kim was just telling me they learned at trying to click in the in the slide itself delayed the process. So if you're interested in, in watching that two-minute clip, go ahead and click on that link over in your chat box, the lower left-hand corner of your screen. I'll tune back in in about 90 seconds. Not so
So practice makes perfect, just like our kindergarten teacher used to tell us. The important thing is not to focus on the perfection, but practice will help rewire that new pathway. Relaxation response, Herbert Benson back in the 1970s, his research identified and proved that through simple meditation techniques of controlling our breath could lower blood pressure, improve heart health, and reduce stress. And he labeled this the relaxation response. More evidence, I've already talked about John Kabat-Zinn, and also, this is pretty exciting, uh, May 17, 2000 uh, edition of the Journal of American, Associ American Medical Association found through a study of slow diaphragmatic breathing, which we'll do today, it's called complete breath or three-part breath, from the integral yoga tradition proved, get this, proved just as effective in reducing anxiety as the antidepressant drug enipramine. Here's your reference if you want to look it up. The folks that I use this with in um, the jail, they are pretty turned on by the idea that they could get the effect of an antidepressant through breathing. And that uh, brain plasticity clip is also really popular when I teach this to the folks that are in our classes at Grafton County Department of Corrections. So our breathing is our built-in remedy. I talked about bottom-up therapies. Those are the therapies that engage the limbic system. It's the mind-body engagement. Top-down therapies are primarily talk therapies, like cognitive-based therapies, talking about figuring out, reframing our thinking to, to respond to emotional. And for trauma-sensitive practice, you want to use a practice that engages this bottom-up approach. Otherwise, talking is not going to really get to the root of where that uh, adaptive coping has come from. So here's your poll question. Um, I've got to look at my notes to remember how to take you there. I think Kim just did it for me. Thanks, Kim. That'll take you a few minutes. Slowing the rhythm of our breathing can slow our heart rate. Is that true or false? Okay, as we come back in, thinking about slowing the breathing, we're going to actually practice that in a few minutes, have a few more slides to go through until we get to the actual practice section of our time together, just waiting until let folks finish up the poll question. The rest of the questions will be at the end, and you'll need to send those in and complete them to get your certificate of completion. So here we go. Back to the Tibetan poet. Our feelings and our bodies are like water flowing into water. We learn to swim within the energies of the body senses. Nikki Miller uh, is a research writer for grants and programs right here in New Hampshire. Um, she's written quite a bit of uh, articles based on research of trauma-sensitive practices um, for the Department of Corrections and is the project developer for residential substance abuse treatment. And she's a great resource uh, for folks here in New Hampshire in, in supporting early recognition and diagnosis is vital for folks with um, undiagnosed trauma related because the trauma sim symptoms tends to drive the continued use. These are just more uh, references of trauma sensitive evidence based practices that are already out there. A lot of people are familiar with seeking safety curriculum, dialectical behavioral therapy, eye movement desensitization, reprocessing, 
sensory motor or psychotherapy, all of these therapies have been proven by research to have the most impact on helping people with trauma to reintegrate into a healthier coping pattern. And I have found Marsha Lenahan has posted on the internet public domain a great series. You could just uh, do your Google search in your search bar, Marsha Lenahan DBT Skill Workbook, and download uh, some great mindfulness practices with relevant worksheets. It's just a diagram of uh, the, the foundation of recovery is learning how to positive affect tolerance, being able to gauge our mood and intensity and recognizing when we're getting stressed early on. And the key is teaching the skill to be responsive rather than reactive. Another poet saying, the body is the shore on the ocean of being. Ocean of being can be overwhelming for some or a wonderful welcoming. It depends on your perspective. So the core issue for treating PTSD is traumatized individuals are prone to experience the present with physical sensations and emotions from the past. So this is how when you see a person explode over a pencil being moved from one side of the table to the other, you know, it seems to the rest of us like, what is the big deal? That could be a, a trauma trigger that has activated the limbic system. The person gets flooded with all the physical sensations and emotions from the past. The only link is the trigger, moving the pencil or the sound of a slamming door or the backfiring of a car or the barking dog, or even a specific song, or it could be a smell. There's all types. The key for creating recovery maintenance skills is to help folks find a safe way to experience them. So this, this 19th century painting I thought was just perfect for, for, for some people. It's really overwhelming to begin to experience the sensations of the body. So for someone who's not yet learned how to feel safely comfortable in their own body, a mindfulness practice could be tremendously overwhelming like a tidal wave. So what we want to create is the calm, cool, warm beach. Maya Angelou said in 93 at uh, uh, President Clinton's presidential inauguration, she read one of her poems and this particular statement for me really encompasses the intention of a trauma-sensitive practice. History, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived, but with courage, need not be lived again. That's our role as the treatment provider, is to help our client create and find their cool, calm sea on the warm sunny beach with blue skies and I know all of us with all this sun was is loving to have some of that sunshine today. So my Angelo's statement, history despite its wrenching pain cannot be unlived but the courage with courage need not be lived again. That's hope. That's the hope that is recovery maintenance. It's a vital component of the continuum of care and is recognized in our NRA SAM criteria as a key component of treatment, keeping ourselves sober, continuing to grow in our understanding and recovery. So the unique features, what makes a practice trauma sensitive? Vanderkalk says, we've got the unique ability to choose how we respond. That's the primary thing that makes us different from all our mammalian relatives. I have two therapy dogs that do my work with me. Panda and Harley are their name. And I always re refer to them. You know, the biggest difference between them and us is besides we're not furry and don't walk on four legs, is we've got the ability to choose. The rest of the animal kingdom does not have consciousness, you know, the philosophical ability to make a choice of should I do this, should I not. We're driven by instincts, and that's what a trauma-driven 
reaction is, is it's making choices from instinct. Again, being responsive rather than reactive. Marsha Lenahan uh, refers to blending the wise mind and the emotional mind. And I'm a Star Trek fan. Captain Kirk's my favorite character. I saw this cartoon and had to put it in there. I, I call him the rational mind and his partner, Captain Kirk, the emotional mind. And the two of them, when they are making decisions together, make, made really wise decisions. I like her analogy of the wise and the emotional minds. And again, cognitive behavioral therapy coupled with mindfulness practice, I've seen a lot of trainings coming out on that, uh, is a great marriage. Teaching people how to identify positive solution-focused thinking patterns. Again, this is just another diagram of what we looked earlier. The green is the basic instincts, the bottom up, our limbic system combined with the emotion, that's yellow, and then the very top, the large part of our brain, red, rational thinking, learning how to engage our rational mind. So we're moving into our practice. The breath and the mind go together. If the breath is calm, steady, and even, so are we. Looks like we're getting some feedback that there were problems about the, the link. Yeah, we were concerned about that. We'll work on getting that improved and maybe we can send that out later if, if it was disrupted. So now I'm moving in the how to. How do you introduce this? and then we'll get into the practice. So of course you want to be yourself. Adapt your presentation to where you are and who you're working with and provide evidence. Explain why you're doing this. Um, basically walk your talk and it's really important to slow your pace of speech. Explain the mechanics of breathing. People really appreciate understanding why and how. Uh, this comes out of David Coulter's Anatomy of Hatha Yoga. And when I saw this, I, I was so excited because it was such a great visual. This is the cross section of the lungs here in the upper left corner. It's a cross section, the, the uh, kind of winged item. And the top is the uh, vertebra, the spinal cord cut in half. And then the heart is towards the front. The C shape, kind of like a pinto bean shape, those are the lungs. The front is on the bottom part of the page. So the point here is the majority of the lungs' ability to take in air is in the back of the body. When folks are anxious, having a panic attack, nervous, we tend to just breathe in the front of the body, the part just around the heart there, where you can see there's not a lot of capacity. The right side shows the diaphragm muscle. That diaphragm muscle is the only muscle in the torso that connects the entire circumference. And it is the diaphragm that enables us to breathe. It kind of works like a bellows, you know, those old timey breathing hand like accordions that breathe on fire. So you can feel it now. If you cough, <laughs> you can feel the diaphragm pull up inside your rib cage and doing a little cough. <laughs> That pushes out the residual air that just hangs out and takes up space. You'll notice down at the bottom, see how slow you can go? Equal time, inhale, exhale. That's one of the mindful breathing practices. So you've got a little script there as well. This diagram, and you all are welcome to copy this and distribute it in your classes if it's helpful, is showing the intercostal muscles and tissue between the ribs. The ribs are white. The bone is white and the tissue is black and gray. For a lot of people who are anxious, this material does not move. So they can experience some discomfort and pain when learning how to breathe fully because it's just like working any other muscle that hasn't been worked. There's soreness there. So it's important to educate your participants to anticipate that and encourage them to continue breathing and taking care of themselves if they do feel 
uh, any discomfort. So here we are, another poll question. Let's see if I can go over to that. Slowing the rhythm of our breathing, here it is, second poll question. The largest area of the lungs is located in the back of the body under the shoulder blades. True or false? So moving along, to truly hear, you must quiet the mind. Start by doing what's necessary, then do what's possible, and suddenly you're doing the impossible. I'm going to move through this because we've touched on that. So I'm going to keep going so we can get to the practice. When teaching trauma sensitive skills, it's the most important thing. It's more about how rather than what you're doing. So, how means uh, arriving on time, preparing the room ahead of time, making sure the, sure the room is private during practice, and for ourselves, dressing and presenting our ways ourselves in a way that's not going to distract them. So not wearing strong perfume or cologne or bright, vibrant colors. Wearing something calm that day. And avoid moving around while you're teaching. Try to stay in one spot. Always introduce what, you, what to expect. Explain the time, time frame. And if changes are needed in the class schedule, provide that so people can know what to predict and encourage placing the value on listening to the body in a friendly, non-judgmental way. Invitatory language, basically always repeating when you are ready, if you like, as you like, always inviting a choice rather than say, now, do this. Even at the beginning, I often uh, in my setting, there's a lot of skepticism in the room, so I encourage folks, you know, if you're not if you're not sure about this, just sit and observe. Just ask for respect of personal quiet for the rest of the folks. So there's a, a list. I've already gone through that. Just more and more detail. I like natural lighting, so I really love it when I can be in a room that has a window and turn the lights off. And of course, establish agreements ahead of time specific to your setting. So, for example, set the um, understanding of what people need can do if they need to leave the room. It's really helpful if you have another staff member kind of hanging out or available outside the room in case someone needs to leave or gets upset or, or triggered and needs to exit. It's good, it's very good to have another staff member just be aware that that might happen so those folks can be tended to. And encourage people that this is a new thing. Be patient with yourself. It's not gonna happen overnight. Encourage people if they start feeling anxious or uncomfortable to take a break and I'll teach you home base. That's our basic practice. Let them know how to go back to home base to regain their sense of um, safety. So these are some basic explanation of why breathing is important. Our brains need oxygen to live. Breathing is how that happens. The long spine, open throat, soft jaw, that's just how to get our anatomy in a position that maximizes the body, body's ability to receive that oxygen to really expand the rib cage on the inhale. Explain the function of the diaphragm. Those pictures that I uh, showed you in the handout, those are great. 
You can share factual tidbits to help reinforce the, the evidence behind it. So this is marking the time that we're going to do our practice. So again, if you need to get up, move around, change your position. Now we're going to begin our practice. So if you want to read along, you can click over on M script uploads and read along. I'm going to read it right off the script. You'll, it'll start on page six. Or you could simply enjoy, relax, and just listen. No need to worry about writing anything down. Everything's already been put for you. So this is Mindful Practice 1. I call it Home Base and Your Anchor. Now find a comfortable seated position in a chair. Pick a number from 0 to 10 describing how you feel in general today. Zero would be no stress and worries. Ten would be this is the worst day ever. And try to remember the number. We'll come back to it. When you're ready, take a deep breath. And let it go. Move your attention to the bottom of your feet resting on the floor. Your feet directly below your knees. Your knees directly in front of your hips, your spine gently stretching up towards the sky, and your head and neck resting on top. Now, take in another deep breath and lengthen your spine up towards the sky and think long spine. Relaxed throat soft jaw. Exhale. One round of breath is inhale, exhale. When you're ready, choose a soft gaze or a focal point or close your eyes. A soft gaze is looking at the floor about six feet directly in front of you. These choices help our mind focus here and now. Remember, our minds are naturally curious and will wander. When this happens, your breath is your anchor back to here and now. There's no need to look at me during the practice. Just listen and breathe. Remember, you're observing your breath here and now. This means no judgment of good or bad, pass or fail. So when you find yourself wandering in your mind, judging or wandering, take a great big deep breath, slow it down, let it go, and exhale. The exhale can be like a, a symbolic let go release. When you're ready, watch your breath without judging. Watch your senses, the sensation of breathing. Listen and feel. Breathe three rounds. One round is inhale and exhale. You've now completed a basic seated practice and established your home base. Remember to use your breath as your anchor back to home base at any time during our mindful practice classes when you find you're feeling anxious or uncomfortable. It's important to feel safe in here and you always have a choice to participate. That marks the end of practice one. Now we'll begin practice two.
see how slow you can go and cool the soup. Now let's begin. See how cool, slow you can go. Remember, your breath is your anchor to here and now. When you begin to feel anxious or uncomfortable, use your breath as an anchor and return to your home base. Reconnect with your home base now. Feet flat on the floor, knees directly in front of your hips. Inhale, breathe up your spine and lengthen it up towards the sky. Exhale, let go of any tension. Release any tension holding in your jaw. Return your eyes to either soft gaze, closed, or fixed. Breathe. Long spine. Relaxed throat. Soft jaw. Breathe. Three rounds, in and out is one round. So if your breathing pace is slower than the rate that I'm going, continue to stay with your own pace. Don't let my pace rush you. When you're ready, your next exhale, pretend you're cooling a hot cup of coffee, tea, or soup, and continue cooling the soup for three rounds. Remember, inhale and exhale is one round. Continue to breathe. While you're cooling the soup, watch how your body is responding. Notice your heart rate. Notice how the weight of your body feels resting on your chair. Remember, you can return to home base anytime you begin to feel anxious or uncomfortable. Your breath is your anchor back to here and now. If you would like, continue breathing three more rounds of Cool the Soup or see how slow you can go. When you discover an edge of discomfort, and if you feel safe to explore this place, this edge, begin to return your breathing pattern back to what feels like your normal pattern and watch how your body responds. Notice your heart rate. Notice where your body tenses. Do you clench your jaw? Do your hands start to sweat? Mouth get dry. Notice if the moisture changes. A dry mouth could be the side effect of medication or a signal of fight-flight instincts, or it could be you're dehydrated and need to drink some water. Just notice the changes and remember, home base is your safe spot if you need to go back. Breathe. You're building positive muscle memory by doing this mindfulness practice and making another pathway for health in your mind by focusing your thoughts here and now on your breath. Remember, your body knows what it needs to be clean, healthy, and strong. This knowing is built into our biology. Mindfulness practice builds our mind's ability to listen to our body, to find its way to balance. If you like, continue to breathe three rounds. Inhale, exhale is one round. At the end of your third round, that concludes your cool the soup or see how slow you can go. Mindful practice three, three part breath. 
continue breathing your normal pace, a relaxed breathing pattern to start with. Remember your breath is your anchor to here and now. Remember if you begin to feel anxious or uncomfortable, you can go back to home base and your breath is your anchor back to here and now. When you're ready, imagine your torso and ribs, rib cage being like a balloon, expanding with your lungs on the inhale all the way around, front, back, up, down. And remember that picture we saw earlier of the cross section of our chest cavity? Remember the largest capacity of the lungs to take in air, that rich oxygenated air, oxygenated blood is in the back of the body, underneath the shoulder blades. Breathe into every part of your lungs, putting the air into the back of the body, down towards the bottom of the rib cage, front and top, like a balloon, rib cage expanding in every direction. If you're comfortable, and if you like, breathe three rounds like this, focusing on the physical sensation of your breath, expanding the rib cage into the armpits, feeling the power of your breath every inch. Remember, if you have any discomfort, back off or return to your home base. Now, when you're ready, and if you'd like, imagine your torso is like an empty, clean glass. Next, imagine your breath is like water being poured into the glass. Fill every inch of your lungs with oxygenated blood. Fill your heart circulate this rich, life-giving force into every cell and tissue. Breathing into the middle of the body, middle of the rib cage, filling up all the way to the top of the torso. You'll feel a pause at the top of your inhale. And naturally, when you're ready, exhale, let it go. Keep with your own pace of breathing. Release on the inhale. Noticing the emptying sensation when you get to the bottom, feeling empty. Do the little cough. <laughs> That's pushing out that residual air that just hangs out, taking up space. You can feel the diaphragm pulling up into the rib cage, pushing that air out. That's the purpose of coughing, expelling contaminants from the lungs. And continuing, imagining filling from top and then emptying down to the bottom. We're getting close to the end, so I'm going to be quiet for 30 seconds. The script says six rounds, but I'm going to say 30 seconds. So you'll have an experience of knowing what it's like to breathe for 30 seconds starting now. Five seconds, and two, and one. Now for our final practice, this is a grounding technique that I borrowed from Marsha Lenahan's script. It's called Five Things. When you're ready, return your breathing to what's comfortable. Move and adjust yourself in your chair. Continue to keep that sense of relaxation that you've built. And if your eyes have been closed, open your eyes and look for five different colors. If your eyes are already open, 
look around for five different colors. Continue to breathe, being conscious of your breath, staying connected to that sense of long, spacious spine, relaxed throat, soft jaw. Look for five different shapes. Five different sounds you can hear right now outside of your room, outside of the building, inside your room. And then finally, count five different sensations you can feel. The temperature of the air on your skin, the weight of your body on your chair, texture of your clothing. That helps bring your sense back into now, here and now space. Body awareness in the chair, on the, on the floor. Notice how your body feels your mind and pick a number between 0 and 10. Remember 0 is calm. 10 is this is the worst day ever. And remember the number at the beginning of class. We've now finished several mindfulness practices. Thank you for joining me for the mindful practice today. Namaste. That's the Sanskrit word for the spirit in me honors and respects the spirit in you. Revisiting the, the number scale at the end of class is, a, is a, like a biofeedback kind of strategy of helping people understand how to rate uh, their sensory awareness. And it's, it's the beginning. It's a great way to build the foundation for trigger management and affect regulation and then beginning to unravel the layers of how to manage the intensity of those. And it's the beginning of re recovery maintenance. And this concludes our time together. There's an example of the sample progress note. I've given you the names of the postures and how it integrates with the recovery maintenance treatment plan. There's all of your references at the end. Lots of links for music, free relaxation music online. And I believe Kim sent everyone the accurate um, link for the brain plasticity. So may we all have warm, sunny days and look forward to being on a warm beach. Thanks so much, everybody. Oh, remember everyone to finish your quiz. It's over there under um, the uploadable documents. It's called what Mindfulness Webinar Quiz. Remember, you've got to finish that and turn that in by email or mail to Kim to get your CEU. Did you want to say anything? No, it's great. Great job. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody.